Hello, my friends. It's Ranger Russ from the Meg's Point Nature Center. Um, coming to you today from my office, I'm going to do another one of my favorite animals today. So as you know, uh, because you've probably seen these programs multiple times, I have lots of my favorite animals. And my favorite animal is, or happens to be, whatever animal I am learning about that particular day. So today we're actually going to be talking about two animals. But before we do that, I want to remind everyone, this coming Saturday we have a very special program at 10 o'clock. We have a couple of guests that will be speaking about Native Americans, uh, particularly here in Connecticut, but uh, Native Americans in general. I also want to see, uh, hello Susan from Michigan, I want to let everyone know you can ask questions at any time, so put them up uh, in the comments and I'll try and answer them as I go. If you're not seeing this live, you can put up uh, your questions on our website or message us on Facebook. And again, our Facebook is Meg's Point Nature Center Facebook page. Uh, and then you can see recorded videos um, of past programs on our website, megspointnaturecenter.org. Please visit the uh, virtual learning center there. Or you can go to the Meg's Point Nature Center YouTube channel. And I encourage everyone to go there as well. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm trying to get 1,000 subscribers. And... It's going pretty slowly, uh, but we're still going to be pushing towards that thousand number so that we can start doing uh, YouTube mobile programs, which means I won't have to be doing them from my computer, which uh, if you see us live on YouTube, it's from a computer right now. Okay, so we're talking about my favorite animal today. And again, I mentioned there are two animals, very, very similar. Uh, and we'll talk about the differences a little bit. But first, we're going to go with a track and we'll see if you can guess what my favorite animal is today. And there's our track. It's a pretty obvious track, but it looks really strange. Let's see if you can, number one, name the animal that left this track. And number two, why does it look so funny or why is it different from most other animal tracks? So this is a typical track pattern left by our favorite animal today. Hello, Westerly. All right, do we have any guesses? I know you guys are a little bit behind. Hello, Florida. A little bit behind me. There's a delay. So I'll give you a moment to uh, put up what you think today's favorite animal is. And then we'll move on to the... Uh, I don't know whether we should do the pelt or the skull next. Let's do the skull next. Rabbit, correct. Leave it to my mom to figure that out quickly. All right, so yes, this is a rabbit. And can anyone tell me why this track looks so funny or different? All right, let's take a look at the skull. So this is our skull, a very long skull. It's missing the lower jaw, but this is the skull. Okay, look at those big teeth there. Now look really closely at the... Let me get out of the picture. Uh, look at those teeth. It's not focusing on the teeth. Why are we not focusing on the teeth? Let's try that. Okay, so look at those teeth. There we go. Give it something bigger to focus on. What color are the teeth? They are white. Okay. Now I brought a skull. We did this one a while back. This is the gray squirrel skull. Look at those teeth. Those are orange, right? So what that tells us right off the bat, we learned that orange teeth mean it's a rodent. Rodents have iron in their teeth. So their teeth are orange. Rabbits do not have teeth. They are not rodents. They do not have orange teeth. Uh, they are not rodents. So this is something that's very common. People think that a rabbit is a rodent, that they're related to rats and mice and squirrels and all the other rodents that we have, beavers. But because their teeth are white, they're not a rodent. That's not because. That's how you can tell. They are a lagomorph. They're in a separate group from rodents. 
far as I know, it's the only lagomorphs that we have in Connecticut are these two rabbits that we're talking about today. So let's take a look at the fur of a rabbit. Now, the fur of the rabbit can range in color quite a bit. It can be very gray, tan, dark brown, light brown, uh, lots of mixes in between, okay? And the two rabbits that we have in Connecticut, so we're talking about two different rabbits today. We have the Eastern Cottontail and we have the New England Cottontail. Their ranges overlap, so in this area, but the New England Cottontail is really only found in New England, a little bit into New York, most of Massachusetts, a tiny bit up into uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine, and a little corner of Rhode Island, and then most of Connecticut, except for the southeast corner of Connecticut, you're not going to find them in Connecticut, but all over Connecticut. However, their numbers are low. Now, they're not listed yet. I really think they probably will be soon uh, listed as uh, endangered species, uh, just because there are so few of them in Connecticut. Now, typically, it's really hard to tell an eastern cottontail from a New England cottontail. And if somebody looks at a cottontail and quickly tells you what it is, chances are they don't really know because really the only way you can guarantee that you can tell the difference is through a DNA test. They are, are very, very similar. Slightly different color pattern, um, but that's not really a, a very good way to tell because they range in color and pattern so much. So we still have the silhouette to look at which everybody knows now, you can recognize it. Now, one thing, the, uh, the cottontail rabbits have small, relatively small ears. When you think of rabbits, typically you think of very long floppy ears. Jack rabbits have crazy long, large ears. The cottontail has relatively small ears for its body. So note the relative shape of the ears for the size of their body. All right, so Let's go back to the track for a second because we talked about the fact that this is an unusual looking track. And what makes this track unusual? These are the front, front feet. These are the back feet. This is the direction of travel. Typically, an animal's front feet are going to be in front and the back feet are going to be in back. There are, remember this, we've gone over this a few times, four different methods of animals moving, males, uh, mammals moving in Connecticut. We have walkers, waddlers, hoppers, and bounders. The rabbit is a hopper, which means it leaps, its front feet land, its back feet pass over, so it crosses its front feet and its back feet. The back feet go around the outside of the front feet. Or, and then the back feet land, then the front feet lift up and leap forward, and that process continues. So when you see their track, when they're moving, if they're just standing or maybe uh, grazing, the tracks aren't going to look like this, but this is how they're going to look with the front feet being in back and the back feet being in front. All right, so um, that's, the, that's our... Uh, cottontail, or cottontail, Eastern or New England uh, cottontails. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, what, what the differences are between the two. The Eastern cottontail, I hope I don't get these confused. I do this a lot. Um, this is where my dyslexia becomes a challenge because these two rabbits are almost the same in my brain. Uh, and they look very similar, so it's okay. So, the eastern cottontail slightly larger, and they reproduce more often. Okay, they can reproduce up to seven times a year. Typically, they're only going to produce uh, three to four times a year, where the New England cottontail is two to three times a year. So they can have two to three litters a year, where the eastern cottontail reprodu reproduces a little bit more often, on average, three to four. Also, the eastern cottontail can have more babies, up to 12 babies, where typically the New England cottontail is only going to have eight babies. 
Another difference is the New England cottontail re uh, reaches maturity, reproductive maturity, at one year. The eastern cottontail can reach reproductive maturity in eight to nine months. So they can get ready to reproduce faster. A typical breeding season is mid-March to June or so, mid-June. Um, for both of them, I believe that in that case, it is the same. Now, another difference, um, <clears throat> excuse me, or let's talk about predators for a second. Um, cause they eat similar foods and they're eaten by similar foods or similar things eat them. So you could expect fox, birds of prey, hawks and owls, cause they, they will be active in the evenings and the mornings, the rabbits will. So the owls have a chance to eat them. Uh, hawks definitely, coyotes will eat them, people will eat them, and unfortunately domestic cats, house cats, can take a rabbit. Now you think rabbits are fast, right? Well, the jackrabbits are fast. They can outrun just about anything. The, the cottontails, they have a little di bit different strategy. If you look at this camouflage, look at how great this camouflage is. It really blends in really well. And again, the colors are going to be a little bit different. Sometimes they've got a little bit of a pattern, sort of a modeled pattern in there. Uh, when, when they get scared, typically they're just going to freeze. And actually the New England cottontail does this much more often than the Eastern cottontail. So there's a little bit of a behavioral difference where the Eastern cottontail will run for cover. The New England cottontail, if, it, if there's not cover nearby, it just freezes. Uh, they'll both do this to some extent. So if you freeze in the open and you have good camouflage, you're going to be all right. But if your predator notices you, it's not going to help you that you froze. So they do have to really watch out for that, for those predators. All right. Now let's see. I don't think I missed any questions. So let me just take a second and... Ah, somebody did get that the back legs appear to be in front. Very good. Okay, I did not miss any questions. So you can post your questions up at any time. And again, if you're watching this, uh, if you're not watching this live, you can send us questions and we will try and answer them. All right, let's, um, let's go back to the skull. So we talked about the things that like to eat them. Now, if you look at these teeth, you can take a guess. Why does it always want to focus on the back of the room? You can take a guess what they like to eat. These are herbivores. They are going to eat plants. Different parts of plants, uh, typically they're not going to dig up any roots. They're going to eat the parts of the plants that are, are above ground. And they are going to eat the leaves, the flowers, in some cases, even the stems of these plants. How many babies? So the eastern cottontail is having a few more babies, up to 12. And the New England cottontail is going to max out at about eight babies. And typical uh, gestation it's about 28 days for the New England cottontail and slightly shorter, 25 to 28 days um, for the Eastern cottontail. So in, in all the reproductive uh, systems for these rabbits, the Eastern cottontail has a, an advantage, a leg up, if you wanna say, over the New England cottontail. They can reproduce more often, faster, more babies, and they mature quicker, so they're able to reproduce again faster. So the Eastern cottontail definitely has an advantage. The New England cottontail also has a limitation of their habitat. The New England cottontail is really only found in woodlands, which we have plenty of in, in Connecticut, right? Forested, wooded areas are where they like to live, particularly edges, woodland edges, because then they can go out into a field and forage for food, and then they've got cover in the woodlands, scrub brush in, in like blueberry bushes and things like that. That's where they're going to 
uh, like to eat. But the eastern cottontail has a much wider range. Now they're found, the eastern cottontail is found over most of North America, or most of the U.S., let's say the U.S. They're found a little bit up into Canada, down into Mexico, um, mostly west of the Rockies, but all over the western or the eastern U.S. Um, New England, down to Florida, over to the Rockies, up to Canada, down to Mexico. Pretty wide range. They're found in deserts. They're found in uh, more swampy areas. They're found in the forests, open fields. Eastern cottontail has, a, has an advantage in their habitat as well. All right, I saw a question. Let's see. Uh, what do you call the babies and where do they make their homes? Babies are pups, I believe, for both of them. And they will typically just dig out. They will dig burrows sometimes or use other animals' abandoned burrows. If you remember my woodchuck uh, program, Rabbits will use the woodchuck burrow, but a lot of times you just find them in a little hollow in the grass. They pile a, a pile of grass on it so it looks level, and that's where they're going to have their babies. All right, let's see. We have another question here. Very interesting for me. Bunny foster and rescue. Very cool. Kits are baby. So I'm not sure kit, pup, or both, which one. Um, it's been a long time. I used to raise rabbits myself. And it's been a long time. So uh, we'll have to look that one up and see what the baby bunnies are called. All right. Uh, any other questions? Let's take a quick peek, see if I missed any. Why is this my favorite animal? I'll have to say probably the, the most interesting thing to me about rabbits are their breeding behaviors. So you know, when, when a New England cottontail um, gets ready to breed, the male will pick up the scent of the female. She gives off a pheromone scent. And he will chase her around. Uh, he chases her until she finally turns and faces him. And they will face off uh, almost like they're challenging each other to fight. And they will uh, just stand there and face off for a second until one of them, usually the female does it first, will leap two feet into the air, just leap up into the air. And then they land and then they face each other. And then the other one will leap into the air. Or the female will do it again. They will continue to do that. When both of them uh, leap into the air, then reproduction can occur. So it's, it's kind of funny when you think about it that way. Uh, but if you can find a video online, it's pretty funny to see the, the rabbits just leaping into the air. It looks like, like there's a spring under and you just pressed a button and they just launched into the air for no apparent reason. All right. So... The other thing that, that makes it my favorite animal, the New England cottontail, I think it's one of my favorites because it's so rare. Um, they right now only occupy about 25% of their original range, uh, which is pretty sad when you think about it, that the area that they used to cover, they're just reduced down to that. A lot of it is due to predation uh, the domestic house cat is a predator that the eastern cottontail is not really used to. You know, they're used to bobcats, but there aren't that many bobcats. And, and bobcats are even uh, more nocturnal um, than, the, than the rabbits. So, the bunny hop dance. Yeah, that's cool. See mom babies every spring around my garden. Usually see only one or two. Sometimes she brings all eight out. So one of the things about rabbits is they might have eight to 12 babies, depending on the species. Not all of them are going to make it to be adults. Uh, you're going to be lucky if you get two to three uh, that will mature. It's the same with ducks. You see, you know, a large 
float of ducks following their, their mom around, not all of, of ducklings, they're not all going to make it to, to be adults. There are lots of predators that like those little baby bunnies. So let's see if I missed, I thought I missed a question here. <laughs> all right. So let's talk a little bit about um, the protecting rabbits. Because, so this is one of the things that happens here at the Nature Center. Uh, people come along and uh, they, they capture baby bunnies because they think that the parents have abandoned them. And this has occurred a few times in my career here at the Nature Center. And a couple of times people have actually caught them in our campground and brought them out to the Nature Center. So what happens is people see the baby bunnies, they're wandering around in the grass it's right near their nest. They nest in a little hollow. I want to give a shout out right now to our mowing crew because they are really good at avoiding mowing over the nests. Um, sometimes I don't know how they see it. I go out and look at the nest and they've left a circle around it. I don't know how they pick it out because you can't really tell that there's a rabbit nest there. But the baby bunnies, even when they're still nursing, they'll only need to nurse maybe once or twice a day. They'll be out grazing the rest of the day, but they still need to nurse once or twice a day. But people see them and they're on their own. During the day, they're foraging on their own. So they go and try and catch them. And sometimes it's pretty hard to catch them, but people are persistent. Then they catch all the baby bunnies and they bring them over and they say, well, we didn't see the mom all day. Now, you have to ask yourself, is there a reason that you didn't see their mom? Perhaps it's because you were chasing the baby bunnies around. The mom is probably foraging. It's going to forage nearby, maybe not within your site, but maybe in the bushes or in cover. She's still going to be foraging. The babies haven't learned to fear people as much, so and they're not as quick, so you can catch them. So you really... You know, if, if their eyes are open, they are mostly weaned. By that point, they are only going to be nursing again once or twice a day. So also, they have got a little white spot on their head. And when that spot is gone, they're, they're done with their mom. When that spot is there and their eyes are open, that's when they're weaning once or twice a day. So you really want to leave them there unless you find the mom has been killed or you find the baby's... Um, are becoming malnourished or dehydrated, you can go and check on them in the evening and you'll, you'll be able to tell that the mom isn't nursing any longer. Either something got her, you know, there are predators out there, so occasionally that happens. All right, let's, uh, I saw I missed a few questions here. Most beautiful woodchucks eat in the garden. Woodchucks are pretty, pretty attractive. They're food on every predator's plate, pretty much. Even the, ah, baby rabbits are called kittens. A group of baby bunnies is called a fluffle. I love that. I did not know that one. There's a new thing for me I can check off today. I learned something new, a fluffle of baby bunnies. That is really interesting. All right, I don't see any new questions. If you have any new questions, you can put them up. Uh, I think I covered everything I wanted to. Oh, <laughs> that's why I have my computer open. I wanna let everybody know the Connecticut DEEP, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, our wildlife division puts up fact sheets. And I actually looked through the fact sheet this morning and that's where I saw the breeding behavior. I didn't know about the leaping uh, with the um, New England cottontail. So you can go on to these fact sheets and it's not just rabbits that are on there. There's lots of uh, great information about our animals. We'll try and put links up. We usually put a link if there's a fact sheet that corresponds to one of these programs. So here's a chance to remind you about our virtual learning center. You go to megspointnaturecenter.org, visit the Virtual Learning Center. You're going to get this video once it's live, and you're going to get a vocabulary list. You might get a fact sheet, a word search, and some other 
uh, educational information that goes along with it. So make sure you check out the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection uh, website to get more fact sheets. So that's what I had open here uh, to remind me of that. And the, oh, there's a, one other thing that I wanted to remind you of. The decline of the New England cottontail began in the 1960s. So from the 1960s to present, their numbers have declined. And that's why we're down to 25% of their original range. So we really want to watch out and protect. And because it's so hard to tell the New England cottontail from the eastern cottontail, uh, you should protect them both. And that means driving the speed limit in state parks. It's one of the most awful things working here at Hammonasset is when you see an animal hit by a car in the park. In most places in the park, the speed limit is 20 miles an hour. There's one little stretch of road where it's 25. Campground, it's 10. You should never be hitting an animal at even 25 miles an hour. So please follow the rules in the state parks. Now, our state parks are open. Uh, camping has ended, so you can visit uh, and bring your dog out on the beach as long as it's on a leash and you clean up after them. Um, but all of our state parks are available and open all year long. So don't think because it's not summer anymore, you can't visit a state park. All right, I'm seeing lots of thank yous, so I'm not seeing any new questions. I'm going to continue doing these programs Tuesday through Friday at 11 o'clock. Planning on a traveling program uh, this Friday, which got rained out last Friday. And remember to tune in at 10 o'clock for a special, 10 o'clock on Saturday, for a special Native American program. So until next time, this is Ranger Russ signing off from the Meg's Point Nature Center.